All right. So good to see you this morning. You know, I just really believe that when you brave 40 inches of snow and ice and a blizzard like we've never seen before, that God's going to bless you when you show up in church. Yeah. Isn't that what happened today? That's what I was led to expect anyway. Well, cold's coming. But you're here, and God does have a word for you. God does have something special for you. And I believe a lot of you are really going to hear the voice of God speaking directly to you, not just through my words today, although I hope that my words catalyze something along those lines, but you're going to hear from God today. He's going to speak to your heart. You're going to have God give you an impression or give you an image or give you something that will bring you to a state of peace. Our series is Find Your Beach, and a lot of times when we think about peace, we think about finding a beach, but not everybody is a beach kind of person, are they? You are, however, called to peace. God has called you to peace. In fact, it's one of the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace. God wants you to have peace. And maybe the imagery for you is not a beach, but more along the lines of King David. David in the Bible. David who wrote so many of the Psalms. David loved a pastoral setting. He was a shepherd, but he loved that pastoral setting. He loved the green rolling hills, the lush valleys, the babbling brook that provided clear, fresh, refreshing water to drink. He loved that, and that's where he found his peace. When I was a little kid, I had an experience that helps me relate to that visually in some respects. Six or seven years old, and my father took me back to his old homestead where he moved when he was seven years old in Mississippi. They had some acreage there and had a cotton farm, and they were dirt poor cotton farmers lived in what we today would call abject poverty. But my dad, as a little seven-year-old boy, just loved playing in those hills, running around barefoot there. And, you know, I'd heard so many stories that my dad had told about this place and all told with a lot of joy and a lot of good memories behind them, a lot of warmth and the expression of feelings that he had about that place. And I remember going there and just fascinated by, well, there's the pond where I went skinny dipping and everybody laughed at me when I dove to the bottom because when he went down, his butt went up and, uh, <laughs> yes. So I got to see all these places and these stories, but the, the one place that I remember the best was this spring that just came right up out of the ground and it was such a spring spring that it, it just immediately produced what was a little stream or creek that went into some woods and that really crystal clear cool water would flow through these woods and we went into the woods and the the banks of that little creek were mossy and dad said oh this water is good to drink and we got down on our bellies and just put our mouths straight to the water and drank and it was like I was in a little slice of heaven as a little kid. It was up to that point probably the, the most memorable nature experience that I'd ever had. And I was just like one of those little sheep that David wrote about by the still water. Still, not meaning just stagnant or not meaning just a pond, but waters that were gently flowing and refreshing and calming. I got to experience that. It was real. So when I think about Psalm 23, that's the kind of image that comes to my mind. I want to assure you this. God wants to take you, not necessarily to a beach, but to that place of peace today. God wants you to experience that peace today. And I know that he's going to speak to you about that. First of all, he's going to speak through his word. Psalm 23 Words are up here on the screen as well. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. 
He guides me along the right path for His name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. This is so often a psalm that we associate with death. But truly, this is a psalm of life. It's a psalm for the living, and it is a psalm of peace. And it's a psalm of reality as well, because sometimes when we think about our beach, our still waters, our babbling brook, that place of peace, we think of escape from reality. But this is not a psalm that offers peace in a fantasy land. This is a psalm that offers peace in the midst of the harsh reality that we face in this life here in this fallen world. This is a psalm of peace in the midst of real troubles. And there are troubles that come. Jesus himself said, in this world, you will have troubles. But fear not, I've overcome the world. We have troubles, but we have no fear because of Jesus. We have troubles, but we have peace because of Jesus. David depicts a place not devoid of troubles. He depicts a place not devoid of harsh reality, but he portrays peace in the midst of troubles, in the midst of harsh realities. He portrays peace in the presence of real enemies who are standing at the door and wishing you would come out from under God's protection so they could take you out. That's an image in this psalm. He portrays peace when we walk through the valley of shadows, the valley of dark shadows. Some of us traditionally know that as the valley of the shadow of death, but literally it means the valley of dark shadows. And those dark shadows may very well be the dark shadows of the death of a loved one. In our first service today, we had one of our members here who 25 years ago lost one of her twin daughters to a drug overdose. Unfortunately, just in the past few weeks, the second twin daughter lost her life to a drug overdose. And she said when she left here today, that sermon was for me. There is peace, peace in the valley of the shadow of death. But those dark shadows aren't just the death of a loved one. And let me just say that if she could find peace here today, so will you. I promise you, you will find peace today. You'll find peace. But it's not just the death of a loved one. It could be the valley of the shadow of a medical diagnosis that kind of strikes fear into you. That's a valley of shadows. It could be the shadow of a son or daughter who's making self-destructive decisions and you don't know what you can do. It's peace in those valleys of dark shadows. The peace David assures us that God provides is the peace that comes even when sorrows like sea billows roll. And we can say, still, it is well. It is well with my soul. Peace that God wants to bring. And you can quote this. Because peace doesn't come from an escape from reality which is why it doesn't come just by getting to another place. It's why it doesn't come just by masking whatever the shadows are, whatever the troubles are with something that comes out of a bottle. Peace doesn't come from the absence of problems or from an escape rea uh, from reality. True peace comes from the presence of God. The presence of God. 
from knowing that God is here, God is with me. That's why in another psalm, Psalm 46, it says that God is a very present help in trouble. Very present. Psalm 46, 1 through 3, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. I like that ever-present, but I like very present, the traditional King James Version approach to being ever-present. Very present. You know, he's ever-present, he's always present, but he's very present. He wants to make his presence known to you. He wants you to have the confidence, the assurance that he is with you and he'll never leave you nor forsake you. He is a very present help in trouble. Therefore, it continues, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. He's very present. On Friday, Lisa and I, along with our daughter Anna, caught an Uber to the airport coming home. And, you know, I always like to talk to people that we're with. Uh, you know, whether it's a waiter or a waitress or an Uber driver, taxi driver, you know, whenever we're served by people, it's very important that we as believers treat people like people. It's a little side teaching. We need to treat people like people. And take interest in them, even if your paths are only crossing for a moment. Because who knows what God's going to do in their life or even in your life in those encounters. And so, found out that he was from Sri Lanka originally. He has lived in London for many years. And, you know, he said, well, we, uh, I asked him what language he grew up speaking. He said, we grew up speaking Tamil, looking for points of connection. I, oh, I have friends who speak Tamil, but they're from India. And he said, oh, yeah, you know, there's a connection in the same language and that sort of thing. And we continued talking, and uh, he talked about his family a little bit there in London. And then, you know, I remembered something else that I know about Sri Lanka, and that is that on December 26, 2004, there was an earthquake in the Indian Ocean that caused a tsunami to come against Sri Lanka. And in that tsunami, 300,000 people died. I remembered that. And not to that detail, but I remembered that tragedy. And I asked him, did you, you know, were all your family safe? And he said, no. He said, I had a brother who had, when we moved to London, he moved to India. But then he and his wife and his six children went back to visit Sri Lanka. And that week, the tsunami came. And he had rented a house only about 200 feet from the ocean. And my brother died, and three of his children died, and his wife and three other children survived, and they were all in the same house. And, you know, one of the things that we had already talked about was the fact that he had a cross hanging from his rearview mirror and had let us know that he is a Christian. And one of the things that strikes me about that whole exchange is that he wasn't bitter or angry with God or say, you know, why did God let that happen? None of that. You know, and maybe it is that he's had 14 years to let the hurt fade a little bit. But the fact is he still obviously has faith in God. And I can tell you this, whatever your tsunami is, it's not just years that will bring healing. It is your ongoing faith in God and your ongoing assurance that even in what is clearly, Psalm 46, a description of a tsunami, God will never leave you. God will never leave you, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake 
with their surging. God is a very present help. In fact, Psalm 23, you don't have to just go to Psalm 46 to see that. You really see that in Psalm 23. It's a psalm of peace, but what brings the peace is the presence of God. It's a psalm of peace, but it's also a psalm of God's presence. See, to experience God's peace, you must experience God's presence. See, God's a shepherd. And we can think about all the different things that a shepherd does. And we can break down the 23rd Psalm, and I've even seen a book that is very enlightening as to what a shepherd will do and what we can expect a shepherd to do. But David doesn't really go into all of that because his emphasis as a shepherd, as a former shepherd to sheep, and now as God had declared him to be a shepherd to God's people as Israel's king, David puts the emphasis not on what the shepherd does so much as the fact that the shepherd is with his sheep. I fear no evil when I walk through that dark valley because you are with me. Jesus himself describes himself as the good shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd. He is the Psalm 23 shepherd. His very name is Emmanuel, God with us. And Jesus said that he is not like a hireling shepherd. What is a hireling shepherd? What does a hireling shepherd do whenever trouble comes? The hireling shepherd, because he's not invested in the sheep, because he doesn't care for the sheep, will run away. Whereas the true shepherd, the good shepherd, will be there in a time of trouble. God is with us. God is there. He's not an absentee shepherd. And even though the troubles have come your way, God is with you. God's with you. In fact, I, I learned something in one of my life groups. I'd learned it before, but never really put it into continuous practice as we were taught to do in Every Man a Warrior. Do we have Every Man a Warrior life groups coming up this semester? Three of them? One, two, and three. So if you've never been to any Every Man a Warrior group, men, Group one, great place to start. And one of their Bible study methodologies is to paraphrase. That is to take a passage of Scripture and rewrite it in your own words. And of course, our rewriting of Scripture is not at the same level of inspiration, right? We all know that. But it sometimes does help you to rewrite it in your own words so that you can really grasp what God's saying to you. And as I'm reflecting on Psalm 23 as a psalm of the presence of God, where that's what David is emphasizing more than anything else in this psalm, I, I came up with this paraphrase. God, as our shepherd, is with us. It's his presence that makes all the difference. Provision is in his presence. Peace is in his presence. Restoration is in his presence. Righteousness is is in his presence. Courage in the face of these dark shadows and enemies is in his presence. Deliverance from our enemies is in his presence. The experience of overflowing grace and favor is in his presence. Goodness and mercy are in his presence. My conclusion, I think I'll stay in God's presence. Every day of my life, I'm going to live in God's presence. In fact, all throughout eternity, I'm going to live in God's presence. Psalm 23, Ed Crenshaw paraphrase. God wants his presence to bring you peace. So God's peace, God's presence go together. But you know, when I think about God's presence and God's peace, I cannot separate that from the principles of prayer. You can't. Because prayer, more than anything, is not bringing to God a laundry list of problems, even though we are to present to God all of our problems. But prayer, for prayer to really function the way God intends, it 
really has to be an experience of the presence of God. You enter into his presence. That's why we start out, according to the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We just worship God and come into the presence of a heavenly Father. We come into God's presence through prayer. Amen? Prayer brings peace. Why does prayer bring peace? Well, you know, when I pray and I believe God is answering my prayers, I have peace that he's taking care of all of my problems. But that's really a small component to the experience of peace that comes through prayer. That's just a teeny portion of it. Because sometimes, I, I don't know if this is the case with you, but it is with me, sometimes God doesn't answer my prayers when and how I want just doesn't happen. God answers my prayers. But not always when and how I like. And yet, I can have peace. Why? Because prayer is not just about presenting my problems to Him, though that's part of it. That's a very important part of it, as we'll see. But the most important part of prayer is just coming into the presence of a Heavenly Father. I'm in your presence. I've come not by the blood of bulls and goats, but by the blood of Jesus. I come in the name of Jesus. But, you know, all those principles of prayer, as valid as they are, boil down to this, an experience of the presence of God. So I don't want to overload you with a bunch of how-tos and prayer principles and things of that, that nature. But, God, I just want to come into your presence. Because in his presence there is peace. I don't want to display, dissuade anybody from believing God for miracles. I, I want this church to be a church characterized by people who believe God for miracles, not only for ourselves, but for a lost and broken and hurting world. Yeah, I, I, want, I want people to know, man, you ask somebody from Victory Church to pray, you're going to see a miracle. Amen? Not just the pastor either, but even people who just go to that church, if they pray for you, you'll get a miracle. Amen? I, I, so I, I'm not dissuading anybody from believing for miracles. But I want, first of all, to persuade you to put your focus not on getting the miracle but experiencing the presence of God that will sustain you and that will sustain others while you're waiting for that miracle. Look at Philippians 4, 6 and 7. A memory verse from book one of Every Man a Warrior. We had somebody quote it in the first service without looking at the screen. He missed two words. I called him out in front of hundreds of people. Because in every man a warrior, you have to memorize it word for word. Amen? Because you don't want to miss out on something important. Amen? Yep. Now I'm going to read it. I'm not going to let anybody else mess up and have to call them out in front of everybody. <laughs> Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything or every situation, according to this version, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. Those were the two words the guy left out in the first service. Important words, too, because thanksgiving... It's a very important way of coming before the Lord. By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. In other words, every kind of prayer, any kind of prayer you can think of, any way that you can think of it, bring it to God. Bring your problems, bring your situation to God. And then what happens? Verse 7, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding. Peace like you can never understand by any earthly manner will guard your hearts and your minds. How? In Christ Jesus. What does in Christ Jesus mean? That's talking really about the presence of God. And I could talk about all kinds of prayer principles that work. You know, the power of faith, the power of Jesus' name that we sing about, the power of Jesus' blood that we sing about. But really, it all boils down to this. Have you experienced the presence of God? Have you come into His presence? And there presented your needs to him. 
And notice this in Philippians 4, 6, and 7. What is the promise when you bring all your prayers to the Lord? Is the promise, then you'll have a miracle. No, that's not the promise. Am I saying that the Bible doesn't teach you can expect a miracle? No, the Bible teaches over and over and over that when you pray, you can expect a miracle. James 5, many others. But that's not what is said in Philippians 4, 6, and 7. What is said in Philippians 4, 6, and 7 is when you do all this with your needs, every kind of need presented to the Lord, then what happens? The peace that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Believe for a miracle. Believe for a miracle, amen? But expect to enter into God's presence as well. That's foundational. That's foundational. You see, I, I've pastorally over almost 30 years as a pastor now seen people who center their relationship with God on a prayer answering God. And there's, in some respects, nothing wrong with that because depending on God to answer prayers is a part of a life of dependence on God. It really shows true humility when you present your problems to Him rather than try to work them out yourself and then go to Him as a last resort. So I, I want everybody to really hear me clearly today. I am not downplaying the expectation of miracles from God. But what I have seen over the years is some people never get beyond that. And their whole relationship with God depends very much on God answering one specific request. Usually answering in a way and in a timing that the person wants God to adhere to. But then what happens when God doesn't answer that request and their whole relationship with God is built around that? Their relationship with God crumbles. Remember one of the first times I saw that a man and his wife came to church. This is 20 something years ago and she had been diagnosed with terminal cancer and they love the Lord from what I could see and they were believing God for a miracle and praise God we've seen God do miracles of healing from cancer here at this church. It happens but that's what they were believing for. And they made it easy for me as a pastor to agree with them for God to heal her. And I, I really believed that in that atmosphere of faith that seemed to just flow from this couple, that God was going to heal her, but then she died of cancer. Now her death was in many respects a peaceful death. She trusted in the Lord for a miracle to her last breath. And, you know, she just went from an attitude of peace and trust in God in this life to peace and trust in God in the next life. And she will receive her full physical healing when we're resurrected at the end. That's the promise. And that's true and that's real and that's not a cop-out. It's real. But unfortunately, that was the last I ever saw of her husband in church. And it really shocked me until I realized that his whole relationship with God was built around her physical healing in this life and only that. And that's not to judge him because, you know, we all handle heartache and pain and tragedy differently. And we should never judge anybody. But I can tell you what God wants us to experience even in that kind of heartache. And that is His peace. Which comes with His presence. Peace that passes understanding. Don't center your relationship with own God and your experience of His presence just to your needs and your prayer requests. Amen? See, God is a present shepherd. 
He is there. He's with me when I walk through the valley of dark shadows. He is a providing shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And you don't have to choose between the two. God as a providing shepherd and God as a present shepherd. But make sure that in your seeking of God's provision, you don't neglect His presence. God wants to be with you. Enjoy God's provision. Expect God's provision. But dwell in the presence of the Lord Almighty. Amen? Enjoy God's provision provision but above all seek God's presence in your life and then you'll have peace amen peace comes in the presence and that comes through prayer learning how to enter his presence and depend on him in prayer now I've talked about faith principles and entering into God's presence and all that kind of stuff, prayer. Do you want me to give you the seven keys? I'm not going to do that because I can tell you this. You want to enter God's presence? It's much like my uh, deep teaching on how to hear the voice of God. You know what that is? Listen. Because the Bible says his sheep will hear his voice. You want to enter God's presence? You want... God's presence to come into your life? Jesus said to his people, this is to his church, not to the lost. He says, I stand at the door and knock. If anybody hears and opens the door, I'm going to come in. We just got to open the door to the presence of God. When I was a brand new follower of Jesus, I'd been raised in the church up until age 15, nine years away from God completely radically transformed in my junior year in college. And about a year into uh, my relationship with God, I felt like God was asking me to get some of my friends together for a time of prayer. And you know what? I didn't know anything about prayer. I knew nothing. And I know for you, I mean, you see a pastor today who's been through however many years of theological education. Think, there was a time he didn't know nothing. And, uh, you know... Maybe I don't know much today, but there was a time I didn't know anything about how to do anything spiritual. I really didn't know anything. I'd been raised in it, but it had been a long time. And God says, you know, get some friends together to pray. I didn't know how to do it. So I just invited three other people, and we went to the little chapel there on our campus. It was an interfaith chapel, no religious symbols anywhere, but it had chairs for, you know, 15, 20 people maybe, 10 people, I don't know, not very many people. And we got together at a certain time, and we sat together, you know, in a little circle, the four of us, and nobody knew what to do. I mean, we didn't know what to do. So we just bowed our heads. No words, no opening prayer, no, no nothing. We just sit, sat in a circle, bowed our heads. No sooner had we bowed our heads than like, woof. It, something supernatural came into that room. The, the feeling was so heavy. It was so powerful. It was as though God was pouring his warmth into us and over us and around us. And we just sat in silence. I don't know how long. 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes. It was a long time. And throughout that entire time, just wave after wave. I mean, just wave after wave. Something so weighty. In fact, the word for glory in the Old Testament means weight. Something so weighty that... Human words could not describe this people. Some of you know what I'm talking about. And, you know, this time passed and we didn't have to say, we didn't have to know how to pray. And the reason I tell you this is not because the only experience I've ever had with the presence of God like this was way back then. And I've been waiting for it again. That could sound that way. But what I'm saying by telling you this story is that you don't have to know anything. Except we were just followers of Jesus there in the name of Jesus, and we just showed up to meet with him, and he met with us. Wow. It was just so powerful. And then after a time, it's just like whatever that feeling was dissipated. You just 
gently left. And it was as though the four of us had our heads on puppet strings all being lifted up at one time. Now, I don't know if somebody else lifted their head sometime during those 15 to 20 to 30 minutes that we were sitting there. Maybe they did. But what I know is as I lifted my head and opened my eyes, I saw the other three people lift their heads and open their eyes at the same time. And the only word spoken was one of us simply said, wow. <laughs> Maybe that was our amen, our hallelujah, our glory, because we didn't have the language. Woo, hallelujah, praise the Lord. We, we didn't have that. We just had meat and the presence of God come. Because God wants us to know his presence. And whatever you're going through right now, whatever the tsunami, whatever the dark valley, whatever the shadow, God wants to just bring his presence into your life right now. I have no doubt. He is our shepherd. He's with us. And we need fear no evil. What I want to do is take some time to allow God's presence to come in. And he's going to come. And what I, what I want to ask people to do is just really everybody stay in the same place because what I, what I want to ask is, this is not for me to have control so that I can have an ideal environment. This is so that people can just put a focus on God's presence right now. And just experience the presence of God. Now God's presence comes primarily to those of us who acknowledge Jesus as our shepherd. He is the good shepherd that David was writing about hundreds of years before in Psalm 23. And so what I want to ask everybody to do is to consider what is your relationship with Jesus right now? And let me ask you, have you made a conscious decision to... Surrender your life to Jesus and to follow him. Let him be your shepherd. And if not, what we're going to do right now is we're going to pray a prayer. A prayer of surrender to Jesus. Who came not only to be our shepherd, but to be the sacrificial lamb whose blood was shed when he died on the cross. To be a sacrifice for our sins so that we could have a full and open relationship with God. With the Father. The Bible says we come to God and come into His presence through Jesus. So if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, what I want to ask you to do is just pray this prayer out loud with me. And we have a scripture verse up here on the screen. Paul says this if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. So let's just repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you love me so much that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. I believe that he died, that God raised him from the dead, and that he is Lord. Forgive me of all my sins and be the Lord of my life. Be my shepherd. Guide me, Lord, and help me live for you. In Jesus' name, amen.